So before we start, I wanted to thank Reverend Master Mayon for inviting me to do a talk on this splendiferous day, surrounded by all these bodhisattvas, <laughs> encompassed by all this beautiful music and invocations. And also to thank Reverend Master Chiyu, because neither you nor I would be here if it were not for Reverend Master Jiu, because there wouldn't be a here here. So we all owe her our gratitude. The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha. So this is our festival of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, which is a wonderful closing or beginning depending on which way you want to look at it, for our introductory retreat guests. So thank you all very, very much for coming to train with us. I was interested when I looked over the lay guest list how um, numerically balanced it was because we had a few people that were 18 and then a few people that were 81. (laughs) And then we have a lot of people in the middle. So I'd like to talk today about what it means to be a bodhisattva. And when I looked up the definition, as I like to do, bodhisattva, bodhisattva, where Master G always pronounced it bodhisattva, bodhisattva is an enlightened being. So when we look around the hall and we see all these images of Avalokiteshvara, we can either go into deep despair and say, I could never be like that. Or our heart can open and we can say, what a wonderful symbol of encouragement, something that I can aspire to, something that will teach me how to act in my daily life. Because that's what training is all about. It's about our daily life and how we put our Buddhist practice into practice. I can remember as a beginning lay Buddhist, and I'd certainly read about Buddhism for years and years, but I finally came to the Abbey when I, after I was living in Seattle. And one of the things that intrigued me the most was that you could, the teaching, that you could convert Greed, anger, and delusion, which even then, as a beginner, I was aware I had a wonderfully enormous amount of all three, that you could convert greed, anger, and delusion into compassion, love, and wisdom. And I thought, wonderful, it's like converting your currency or something. Just decide to do it, and then it's done. And that's been about 30 years ago, and I'm still working on it, so don't be put off if you go home and it doesn't happen overnight, unless it's a very long night. Um, So how do we do it? How do we convert compassion, love, and wisdom? How do we convert greed, anger, and delusion into compassion, love, and wisdom? How do we take that compassion, love, and wisdom and have it part of our daily life, something that we wake up and go to bed with? I want to say, since this is February 14th, that the love we're talking about is not the Valentine's Day kind of love. It's more than a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates. Although those those are very nice. And when I was in the world, I was grateful um, to get chocolates and bouquets of flowers. But there's more to it. And so it's the more to it that I'd like to talk about and discuss a few of them. A few days ago, I heard a song by Josh Ritter called Homecoming. And I thought, 
homecoming, homecoming, that rings a bell. Well, the first bell it rang was when I was at college, and homecoming meant football games, parades, and a lot of drinking. And I thought, no, 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 that's not the homecoming I want to think about. But what I really started to think about was what does coming home mean? I had also recently read a book by Thich Nhat Hanh called Coming Home, The Buddha and Jesus' Brothers. And it's a wonderful book if you have a chance to read it. And I thought there has to be some place that is home for us. And brought up the question of what is our true home. And it seemed to me that when I came to the Abbey, gosh, way back in the 80s, it was because I wanted to find my true home. And I had a wonderful home, a wonderful teenage son, wonderful job, but there was something that I knew needed to be there, and it wasn't there. And I wonder if, for all the many reasons that all of you have come here today, many for the first time, but a lot of you again and again and again, is it because we're looking for our true home? And then, when we were singing this morning, chanting these wonderful invocations. There is that very moving invocation that Reverend Master Coton wrote. And one of the verses, the fifth verse, is, sorry, it's the last verse. To you we turn... You are the way, the goal. Way is capitalized. The journey and its end. Regarder of the cries. Oh, guide our hearts to peace, our reaching home. So it seems obvious to me that home is, and our true heart, is our practice of compassion, love, and wisdom. So how do we get there? We know our true home is our Buddha nature. Our true home is the heart of practice. Well, I think that there are many ways to get there, many streets and roads. But I like to think of it as what understanding can I develop that will help me find my own true home? And the three that I came up with were understanding impermanence, living with uncertainty, i.e. not being in control. (gasps) Oh my, oh my, that's very scary. The second one was all acceptance. And on Reverend Master Stupa, It says, all acceptance is the key to the gateless gate. That's worth a whole Dharma talk in itself. It's worth a whole year of study. We don't have that kind of time. We just have between now and tea. All acceptance means this is the way it is for the moment. For the moment. And then the third understanding that I found helpful was letting go letting go of wanting, letting go of our attachments, letting go, this is the hard part coming up, letting go of the me, the me, the my, the mine. Letting go of this is good, this is bad, I want this, I don't want that. Simply letting it all rest and letting go of it. So then the next question that came to my mind was, okay, I want to look at impermanence. Um, I want to look at all acceptance. And I want to look at letting go with an eye toward making these 
understandings, part of my blood and bones, the way that I have been trying to make the precepts part of my blood and bones for the last these many years. So what do we need to get started? Because what we need to do is do it here and do it now. I think that one of the things we need to get started is at least a little understanding of karma, a willingness to look very deeply at the messy bits because we have, quote, good karma and we have bad karma. But I think that most of us are fairly self-judgmental and we tend not to say, I'm a generous, kind person. We tend to say, oh my God, I've done it again, you know. How could I possibly have done that? I'm a bad person, I'm an angry person, I'm a greedy person, etc., etc. But all of those things are karma. And we can begin to understand that by sitting still. So one of the things that helps us to understand karma is understanding impermanence, being willing to live with uncertainty, knowing that all conditioned things arise, abide, and pass away. During January, I started reading a book that one of our congregation members in Eugene sent me, and it's called Inside the Grass Hut, and it's by Ben Connolly, who is a Zen priest training at the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. It's taken from the classic poem, Inside the Grass Hut. And I'm going to be reading a few quotes from here. And on the very first page, what it says is quoting the Buddha to say, everything that comes to be must pass away. Make your peace with this and all will be well. Suffering, i.e. dissatisfaction, irritation, uh, not being happy, whatever you want to call it, suffering arises from trying to turn away from impermanence. And liberation arises from facing it fully. It's interesting to me to see that the habits that I had of turning away from suffering in my lay life, um, which could have been a glass of wine or sex or hiking, uh, depending on the time and the season, uh, didn't work when I came to the Abbey. But being a very creative individual, I could still find other ways to distract myself from my suffering and because there's always a lot of work to be done in the monastery one of them was well I'll just work a little more I'll just work a little bit more so wherever we are whatever situation we find ourselves in don't um, belittle your capacity for distraction and not facing suffering and not facing the messy bits So looking at impermanence, one of the things that we do is we surround ourselves with objects of permanence. Um, A new car, new clothes, a new house. I'd say a new job, but in these times that's probably not true. I'm always amused when I come across the ad and advertisement for diamonds because it always says diamonds are forever. And I know that's, that actually that's not true. And in most cases, neither are the relationships that diamonds are intended to celebrate. But they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that in the disclaimer. So... How do we make peace with impermanence? Because that's what we need to do. Well, one of the ways 
that Ben Connolly talks about in this book. And this is taken from the poem inside, is taken from the poem, the, uh, her, the Grass Hut Hermitage. And what he says is that, this is the first line of the poem, I built a grass hut, and I'm going to talk about the grass hut later, but you can start thinking what that's a simile for. I built a grass hut where there's nothing of value, nothing of value, that all things are equal, and there's nothing of real value except the value we give to it. And he talks about that and says, a mind where all things are equal is a mind at peace. When we value something, there is always comparison. There's always something we don't want. Think about it. If someone criticizes you, what's your response? Da, 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 da. If someone compliments you, what is your response? Da, 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 da. Are the da, da, da's the same? No. Chances are they're not. Chances are one will make you gloomy or angry, and the other will make you buoyant and pleased. And there's no harm in that as long as you don't hang on to it. And as long as you don't, and as long as we recognize there's value in both of those things. And it's the same value. So it's really something that took me a lot of just quiet reflection to think about what are the things I put value in. I put value in being able to do things. But you know, as I get older and decrepitude sets in, I can't quite do all the things I used to do. And so it's a, been a, at first it was very annoying, irritating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now I think about, oh, oh, isn't that wonderful? I'm not able to do this anymore. I'll just have to let someone else do that. When someone else says, may I help you, I'll have to say, yes, thank you, instead of, oh, no, I can do that myself. I can do that myself. So when we talk about giving up attachments and letting go of the self, recognizing impermanence, recognizing that all things are equal will bring us a good deal of peace of mind. And I think this is a good place to say that if we had the time, I'd like to read this whole poem to you and Ben Connolly's commentary on it, but we don't. So obviously, if you haven't figured it out, we all exist in a grass hut. Grass hut, thatched roof, how long is it going to last? It's our body. The grass hut that Shito refers to in this classic Zen poem, metaphorically speaking, is our body. And we all know that this body is not my own. It's subject to old, death, old age, disease, old age, and death. Sometimes old age comes first. Sometimes disease comes first. But we know that death is the last part, at least as we know it here on earth. So why am I so attached to this body? Why am I so attached to my mind? Now, which drawer did this go in? Where did I put my keys? Because we think our body and mind is our true self. But our true self is neither our body or our mind. So there's impermanence. There's all acceptance. And I think that all acceptance is, is crucial in understanding and a preliminary <coughs> looking into all acceptance is critical for 
our ability to change, our willingness to change. And, of course, the status quo is easy. Change is hard. But it's helped when we know that we can actually let go of our habits of body, speech, and mind. When we have confidence that we can actually let go of our habits of body, speech, and mind. And when we have faith and trust in the Buddha's teaching, in the Buddha nature of all beings, which means ourselves. So how can we jump into all acceptance and practice it? We can recognize that all is one and all is different. I was repeating that mantra to myself, all is one and all is different. And I thought, you know, when we look at the world today with all the greed, hatred, and delusion, all the killings and torture, all the refugees, all the people that have no bedding, food, water, medical care. What a different world it would be if we all truly believed and practiced that all is one and all is different. Imagine the world as it could be. Well, we can't change the world, at least not overnight, but we can change our self. And this is where we have to start, is just going away and saying, I have started to change myself. Don't wait till you get home, regardless of whether you've come for the retreat or you live nearby. Just start right now, sitting here in this chair, in this very moment. I'm going to change and I'm going to practice compassion, love, and wisdom in my daily life. One of the things that's been helpful for me in looking at all acceptance is having some understanding of the volitional nature of karma and what karma is. So I'm going to read a very quick and brief quote from Buddhism from Within, by one of my favorite authors, Her Master Daisui McPhillamy. And what he has to say about the nature of karma is that the name given to the link between people's actions and how they feel is karma. It's not fate or destiny. It's not a mysterious force which controls a person and about which nothing can be done. The exact opposite is true. Karma is a natural consequence of what we do and therefore it can be changed by simply doing things differently. I have circled the word simply doing things differently because actually it's a simple com- it's a simple concept it's not so easy to do and it can be done it can be done so one of the ways that we let go of the habitual habits that we have that make us unhappy and other people unhappy, that cause us harm and cause other people harm, is by letting go of wanting things to be different. And we have to read wanting as attachment. There's not a problem with wanting to be a better person. There's not a problem with wanting to keep the precepts. There's not a problem in wanting to understand the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. The problem comes in when we develop an ideal 
in our mind of how I'm going to be now that I'm a Buddhist keeping the precepts. And of course that only lasts about 30 seconds and then we either give it up or go into despair. So think about letting go as letting go of our attachments. Letting go of our desire for enlightenment. And I'm sure that there must be at least one of you who came for our introductory retreat who thought, introductory retreat, weekend at a Zen Buddhist monastery, Friday through Sunday, I'll be enlightened by Monday morning. (laughs) But I have to tell you, it's not going to work that way. It's not going to work that way. And what Reverend Master Daisui says in Buddhism from within, enlightenment is not a state or an experience. Got it? Not a state of, um, or an experience. It's an entire way of being. And it is a way of being that requires of people, among other things, that we give up the very thinking about things, which is the basis of talking about anything. But you have to talk about things because words are all we have. So enlightenment is our everyday practice of meditation and the precepts. Is it possible that all I have to do is get myself out of the way and enlightenment will happen? Yes. That's what it is, letting go of self, stepping aside and letting the practice happen. Letting go into not knowing because we're so accustomed, we're so accustomed in our world to knowing everything. You know, if I don't... uh, I wanted to know the other day because I saw this wonderful cartoon in the New Yorker. It was about cats. It was about a a group of dogs at a round table playing poker. And there was a tiny little cat holding cards in a serene fashion with all the chips piled up in front of it. (laughs) And one of the dogs was saying to the other dog, if he's got a tell, I haven't found it. And I thought, what in the world is a tell? Well, I looked it up instantly on the Internet, and a tell in poker is somebody's behavior. You know, there's a little, when you've got the right cards, I've never played poker. I'm sure some of you have. When you've got the right cards, you make a little, a little something, a behavior or a little smile or whatever. Instant gratification. I was so pleased that I had solved the mystery of this wondrous cartoon. But enlightenment doesn't work that way. You, can't, you can look up enlightenment on the Internet, but it's not going to make any difference in your daily life. In your daily life, we have to practice mindfulness. We have to practice meditation. We have to start learning to keep the precepts. There's a sentence that came up for me two sentences that came up for me the other day that I would share with you before we close. May we all learn the joy of all acceptance and the freedom of impermanence. And I had never thought of connecting joy with all acceptance and freedom with impermanence. And then I thought, maybe I'll have it backward. Maybe it's learning the freedom of all acceptance and the joy of impermanence. I like them both. So I'm going to end with a question for you to take with you, if you take nothing else with you. Because another thing that came up for me And it, and it surfaced after, no, it's probably been there, but after I was reading Inside the Grass Hut, a little quote that he has of Dogen. And 
He doesn't say exactly where Dogen said this, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. And it says, and it says, here is the place, here is the way, capital W, this is where it unfolds. It's right here, it's right now, it's in this very moment. This is the way of the Buddhas. This is the Buddha nature manifesting itself. The place is here and the time is now. So the question I would pose to you that you might ask yourself as I ask myself from time to time, if not here, where? And if not now, in this very moment, when? Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha. Thank you all so much for being with us this weekend.